Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and read this um, because I won't be home today. That way y'all can just get it done. This is lesson three for the Epic of Gilgamesh. Hold on. Just... Close the door so I won't bother y'all while you're in there doing your school this morning. Okay, so this is lesson three. So y'all can go ahead and do your um, all your vocabulary stuff. You know how to do that. Um, and then there's the recall questions. And then on 3.5, there's two critical thinking questions. And, um, and I'm going to grade all that here in just a few minutes, Addie, when I get done with this. Um, and just choose one of those to do. So anyway. All right, so go ahead and do your vocab. And uh, then I'm going to go ahead and read. So this is going to be in the book on page 26, where it's at the grief of Gilgamesh. Because remember now, um, Enkidu is dead. So we're going to read to page 37, top of page 37. All right, so the grief of Gilgamesh. A constant flood of tears did wash the face of Gilgamesh. His soul could find no place to rest, since painful grief did prick his heart. A gnawing hunger deep within, apart from other sorrows, searched the hidden nooks about his being. Like the wolf that looks for easy younger prey within a lair, among the rocks, but tasting only musty air, that hunger was the name of Enkidu. He spoke it often as his sorrows grew. His grief was great. He walked the desert sands. Make sure you shut the door because Maddie's asleep in there. His grief was great. He walked the desert sands. In search for naught, he moved about, yet bands invisible surrounded him, his pain was even greater since he did attain a wondrous friendship of rarest kind, but death did steal this friendship in his mind, for Gilgamesh no longer seemed as king, but played the common man, since sorrows bring confusion to the soul. He sought escape to hide from everyone and made a cape of skins upon his head. He threw some dust. The king appeared insane, since now his lust for solitude transformed the learn to learn the way to everlasting life. This gave a ray of hope to Gilgamesh. If I should gain the secret, then my friend will live again. He knew about a man the gods had spared. When floods did cover all the earth, he shared a ship with others to escape the flood. The wise old, let me see if I can pronounce this right. Ute, n Ute, Napishit, no, Ute, Nap, Ishtam, Ute, Nap, Yut Napishtim. Yut Napishtim. All right, down at the bottom. He who saw life, apparently the Noah of the Bible. So Yut Napishtim being another name for Noah. So the wise old Yut Napishtim understood the sacred secret for eternal life. The king would seek the elder and his wife. So he's going to find Noah. And remember, the Epic of Gilgamesh is supposedly one of the very first ever pieces of literature written in history. That's what they say. So he's going to find Noah. All right, the scorpions. The king now walked along a narrow ledge. He thought to pray to Sin. Now, Sin is the moon god. To seek a pledge for safety while he journeyed to the land of Utnapishtim. He faced the moon with hand upon his sword, yet words could not be found. So many times I've prayed to sin, that round, bright deity of evening sky who helped me sleep. I fear the lines dwelling here that creep in dark, darkest night, that stalk a prey to eat. He bowed his head, and with his fist he beat his breast, his loss to death, and caused his plot. The frightened king did miss his friend tonight. At last, the mighty Mashu... Now, Mashu says it's located in the Lebanon mountain range. The sun retreated here after day was over. So it's the place where the sun lived at the end of the day. At last, the mighty Mashu mountain loomed before his eyes. He felt his quest was doomed while gazing upward at the massive rock. Ascending through the clouds, a mist did block the light from ever falling to the ground below. About him nothing moved, no sound was heard. This loathsome place was dark and dank. Like musty tombs, the misty air was rank. 
with vapors foul escaping through a breach. He made his way through slime and muck to reach a gate, but greater threat than mud retards his steps before the entrance Entrance stood its guards. One frightful guard was partly scorpion and part was man. The other champion appeared as womankind with stinging tail. The face of Gilgamesh turned deathly pale, for he had heard about this horrid pair, intelligent and wise with deadly stare. Upon the ground he fell and closed his eyes, for certain death would greet the one who tries to look upon the monster's deadly gaze. Then spoke the male, My wife, this man that stays upon the ground, is two-thirds God. Our look will do no harm to him. He seems forsook of health and life itself. Arise, good sir, what mission brings thee here? Thou surely heir to come, expecting entrance past this gate. Return and go in peace to thy estate. Replied the king, I've traveled to engage the truth by seeking you Napishton. Sage, beyond these mounts, my friend, I've lost in hope to see his face again. I only grope for lot. Yet he that braved the flood to live another golden day can surely give me words about eternal life and death. I'll find him now or breathe my final breath. Then laughed the scorpion, the way is dark. And only death will greet thee here. Now mark my words. Thy foolish quest has failed to learn about such secret things. These thoughts concern the gods and them alone. This knowledge grand remains a mystery lost. So leave this land. Yet Gilgamesh exclaimed, To suffer more I can't. My mind and grieving heart are sore and ache with painful loss. Now open wide the gate that I may enter. Stand aside. He sharply spoke, Proceed, this gate prevents thee not. His wife, with softer tone, gave hints about the path before him. Day and night are both the same. Beware, there is no light. They watched till Gilgamesh had disappeared from view, then shook their heads, the worst they feared. So he came to the gate of whatever, as he's going in his search of Udnapishtim, so he can find the secret to eternal life, so that his friend will come back to life. Little does he know. All right. The road of the sun. The monster spoke the truth. The way was black. A darkness keen that could be felt. The lack of light renewed his fears. He looked around in front, behind, and either side he found. A never-ending darkness deep with slow and cautious step. He often prayed to know the right direction. Many days he walked in darkness. Nothing could be seen. He talked to Enkidu as though his friend were near. He called his name aloud to calm his fear. The endless night oppressed him as he made his way along the path. He was afraid to deviate at all. He never knew which dreadful way was right. He blindly drew a step and then another, whether up or down. It seemed the same. The bitter cup of death appeared before him. So he thought, I'll die within this tomb that fear has wrought. But then a beam of light did faintly show itself, thus giving hope and life. His slow advance began to quicken as the light appeared more brightly at the end. Night was over as he ran aside the cave. A valley rich with gems and fruits that gave a pleasant smell received the weary king. He felt relieved to hear a songbird sing. But loneliness replaced the joy. He gazed upon the lovely vale and stood amazed. If only Enkidu could see this view. Where art thou, Enkidu? Oh, Enkidu! He felt the stinging pain of being freed, and like a man gone mad, he felt the need to tell the peaceful valley why he came. I had a friend who died too young. His name was Enkidu. Together, no defeat we met. We killed Humbaba, though he beat my friend with mighty blows. And then the bull of heaven did we slay. My heart was full of joy, for each would help the other one to overcome his fears and doubts. A none could have a better friend than he. He clapped clasped his hands. We were like this, but soon he grasped the tree to lean upon the trunk. The veil was deaf to any argument or tale. The silence turned oppressive as he bowed his head to weep. 
His friend was not allowed to see this valley rich with gems and fruit, or feel the bliss of any good pursuit. Oh, when could do, my friend, at last the king rehearsed the reason why he came. I bring a heavy heart because of loss. How weak I feel without my friend who died I seek. Eternal life for which to give my friend. Then joy I'll have and grief with sorrow's end. The silent veil responded, not at all. The king insanely talked as to a wall. So he came out into this lovely meadow of some sort, and he he loved it And then at first, and then he was like, oh, it's terrible because Incadus not here. And then he just, he said he just wanted to tell everybody why he's here, and he just blurted out why he's there. He's looking for everlasting life to give to his friend so he'll come back. And then he just, he just knew nothing was listening to him, so he just sat down there and started to cry. Siduri, the maker of wands. He made the lonely trek across the plain. King Gilgamesh just rambled on, insane with grief, conversing to himself. Soon sand replaced the meadow's grass to form a land of shifting dunes, all sculpted by constant breeze. An inn appeared, a place for food and ease. A woman named Siduri kept the inn, Alone, she dwelt apart from friends and kin. She occupied her time with making wines from sundry fruits and tending to her vines. The king approached the door and madly knocked. With violent fist, the weathered boards that blocked his entrance to the end, Siduri peered behind the door to see a man with beard untrimmed, a face grown thin and reddened eyes. She thought, this man has killed a foe and flies from rightful punishment decreed before. There, let me in or I shall break this door. Who's there? What business hast thou, wanderer? Siduri shook with fear. The traveler will go away, she prayed. I'm Gilgamesh of Uruk. Fear me not. What? Is my flesh so loathsome as to cause thy great dismay? I miss my friend who died a woeful day. We fought and killed Humbaba. Then the bull of heaven met its death. Our lives were full. If thou art truly Gilgamesh the Great, thy deeds are known to everyone. Berate thyself no longer. Why this countenance of gloom? Enjoy thy earthly sustenance. Enjoy my life without my friend? I've grieved and suffered much because my friend received a mortal wound while fighting by my side. Canst thou believe this grief I felt to hide? Responded she, such moping grief is bent upon unmanliness. These tears are spent in vain. Thy friend is dead and gone. Forget the dead who has no trouble nor regret. Art thou a king? Then act the royal part. Thy friend let go, then mend thy broken heart. Then Gilgamesh with sobs cried out, My friend, O oh, Enkidu, my friend, I fear to spend my life without any thy company, for none can know my soul. Thou art the only one. Then tenderly Siduri pulled the latch and opened wide the door, a bed of thatch, invited Gilgamesh to sleep. He fell along its length, continuing to tell about his friend. Siduri pressed a rag with cooling water on his brow, a bag of softest straw she placed behind his head. Siduri sat beside him by the bed and listened what the king would say. This talk, she said, is that of older folks. They walk along with friends who have de that have deceased, who's heard of them or even cares. This is absurd. So he's talking in his sleep about Enkidu. The king would mumble as he tried to sleep. Oh, Enkidu, though all forget, I'll keep thy memory. As brothers, we prevailed against our foes, but death with him we failed. He died a common death like other men. I looked within his dark and dirty den to see him lying motionless. I told him, come arise, some day he will, and hold my hand once more. But he was stone still dead. I saw his face collapse within his head. Siduri took the rag to wipe his brow and softly spoke a brief refrain of now, now, yes, yes. Sitting by his side, she watched the ailing man whose care was soon dispatched. My goodly king, she said when he awoke, thy grief shall never cease. Siduri spoke to Gilgamesh as if he were a child. Thy constant grief shall never cease, nor mild thy life shall ever 
thy life shall ever be if thou persist upon this foolish quest thy deeds resist the will of heaven's ways the gods bestow on us the ways of death with sorrow owed to every living man the gods reserved eternal life for their delight unnerved by this this is the scheme of things accept thy lot enjoy the sun thy children kept in later years and fleeting life today remove thy needless burden come what may so Siduri is saying, look, everlasting life is just for the gods. They just let us live and just enjoy your time because that's just the way it is. He bathed and donned some clothes Siduri kept. She hinted tenderly that most adept she was as wife, that he could benefit from marriage if he stayed. The king did sit and pondered what to do. Nay, nay, the quest I shall pursue before I ever rest. He tossed the fancy clothes aside and wore once more the coats of skins. Then to, sh then to the door he went. Though thou art kind, I shall not stay. To you them, I must go. The way I need to know. For if thou carest aught for me, reveal the path of thee besought. Siduri shook her head. Canst thou accept the folly of this quest? For many wept in hope for dreams that failed. From their mistake much wisdom should be gained. Across the lake that's black as pitch no mortal man has sailed. Successfully attempts have all but failed. Art thou so special that success must grant thee favor? Nay, now stay and rest. Don't rant and rave a moment more about thy need. Foreseeing you'd napish them. Stay, I plead. So she's saying the only way to get there, nobody has ever done it successfully. You have to go across the Black Lake and nobody's ever done it. So why don't you just stay here? I'm losing time by standing here. Now point the way and with thy blessings, please anoint. With anger now, Saduri spoke. Self-love will kill thee yet. Then go, go, thou shalt prove me right to happily reach the other shore the boatman, your Shanabi, that is Utnaptishim's boatman, the guy who gets you across the lake, does his chore, does this chore. The boatman knows about the mystic rocks to help that dreadful passage there. He docks his boat beside a stream just over the hill. The fool I am, O king, I'll take thee still. When disappointment mocks thy foolishness, return and we shall live in blissfulness. So she's saying, okay, dude, if you make it, come back and I'll marry you. Thus promising, she slammed the door, but cried, the king, my journey lacks a selfish pride. I go to find eternal life and brave the lake of death unselfishly to save my friend, compels my lonely pilgrimage. This final trek I pray my grief assuage, but silence issued from behind the door within the inn beside the coastal shore. Then Gilgamesh did lose control. His head was hurting from his shout to save the dead, his friend. This noble quest none seemed to grasp. His angrily, he angrily did glance about. His hand did clasp his axe with steady stokes. He shattered gate and fence, but soon his anger did abate. With axe in hand, he quickly ran to ask the help of Urshanabi, Urshanabi, with his task. So basically, the woman was like, you are so selfish. Why are you doing this? And, and he was mad because she was saying it. And he's like, I'm going. So, all right. This is the last section we're going to read today. This is your Shanaby and the Lake of Death. Soon Gilgamesh espied a blackened boat. Yet several stones withstood his way. He smote the errant rocks with frenzy stokes to break and smash them into bits to swiftly make a path to reach the shore. The boatman saw the deed performed. The aged man did gnaw his tongue to stop his laugh with scornful tone. Oh, your shanaby, jeered the king. Well done, thou fool. With start, the gasping king did turn to see the boatman standing near. With stern reproach, he glared his hoary hairs, did grace his head, but dark complexion was his face. From gloomy mists arising from the sea of blackish ooze were death a certainty. The boatman said, Thy ample strength has crushed thy chance to cross this lake. I could have rushed thee to thy destination with these sacred stones. This senseless sacrilege no god condones. So Gilgamesh crushed up the rocks, and, and your Shanaby saying, Dude, you just broke the way to get across. Then Gilgamesh collapsed upon the heap of rubble. Strength was gone to even weep. 
He placed his head upon his knees and sighed. Then much fatigue he spoke, my friend has died. I want to learn what Utnapishtim knows about eternal life. I crushed the stones like foes that blocked my path. My guilt I must confess, but help me cross this lake of woefulness. The ancient boatman smirked a mocking pout. That grief exceeds all sorrows known. I doubt that none has lost a friend before. How sad those eyes, how thin thy face, relate, poor lad, the reasons why thy sufferings are worse than those who undergo this common curse. So basically, the guy is saying, what makes you so special? Everybody's lost somebody. What makes your grief so special? Then Gilgamesh with sad reply, my pain is great, old man. What aim have I to feign my sorrow keen? To find a way to cure my friend of death? Here lies my motive pure. Now, your Shannaby laughed aloud. To find a cure for death? Oh, thou hast lost thy mind. But Enkidu was more than just a friend. He saved me twice in fights against the fiend whom Baba and the bull of heaven brought to earth by Ishtar's hate. My death it sought but failed because my only brother killed the bull. We've yet adventures unfulfilled, with noble goals to, to gain. Alas, he died, a common death like common folk. I tried to reason why he died so senselessly. If I had died, he'd near abandoned me. The king had finished, only feeling grief. I come to the end of my woe. I need relief from memories that plague my soul and mind. Come quickly, tell me. Now the way to find the elder Utnapishtim, scale the mount or cross the lake. The way, old man, recount. Basically, how do I get to Noah? With harshness, your, sh your Shanaby spoke. Thy hope to cross this lake beneath thee lies. That slope of wanton wreckage ends thy hopeless quest. Didst thou not hear my simple words? At best, thou canst return in peace from whence thou came. What homage re rendered to thy brother's name? Had thou just half the veneration owed these sacred stones, thy prayer I would have bowed. Impatiently the king did speak. The way, there surely is another way. Betray me not, now plainly show the course to take. I find, to find a way, I shall make no mistake. I see that thou art earnest yet. Take heed to what I say, then do, for thou wilt need some staffs. Now go to yonder woods and hew some sturdy sapling poles. Mark not a few. Affix a lump of coal to every pole. The use of these will help attain thy goal. With hope returned, glad Gilgamesh did cut with vigor many sapling poles about the tops with coal, abut the tops with coal, and heap the blackish boat with all the poles that it could safely tote. He pushed the bow from off the shore to free, the boat adrift upon the murky sea. The king had strained to hear the boatman's last instructions from the shore. Take care to cast each sapling pole to the lake of death, destroys into the waters dark. If one employs the other poles, he might succeed to make his way across the lake. Beware, forsake to touch the deadly waters with thy hand, then shortly miss obscured the sight of land. So he's saying, dude, be careful with those things and don't touch it with your hand. He pushed the boat until the poles were spent, but one with this he made a mast and rent his coat of skins to make a sail. At last, the shore he saw, his lonely trip was past. All right, so he's made it across the lake to see Ute Neptishim. So go ahead and answer the questions. I'll give you a grade, and we'll be finishing up this tomorrow.